Welcome to another episode of This Week in Space. Today, Jeffrey Notkin, meteorite hunter and collector, joins us to talk about meteorites, what they are, how you can find one, or how to buy one if you don't want to tramp around the desolate wilderness for weeks and weeks, starving to death, and the upcoming auction of his personal collection. Stay with us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 15, recorded June 10th, 2022, The God of Space Rock. Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the Space Rock Jock Edition. Today we're visited by Jeffrey Notkin, meteorite collector and merchant, award-winning TV presenter and producer, former president of the National Space Society, and star of the Science Channel's Meteorite Men and All Around Rock and Tour. Hello, Jeffrey. How are you? Hello, Rod. I am splendid. Thank you. It is. People always go, oh, I, you know, I'm a fan of the show, but I'm really I am really a fan of of both of you, you stellar hosts and your accomplishments. So I am uh, I I'm pretty thrilled to be here. Well, thanks. And I'm a fan of being your pal and meteorite men. So we've we tripled up. And I'm, of course, Rod Pyle, editor in chief of Ad Astra Magazine. I'm joined, as always, by the inestimable, in, 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 inestimable <laughs> Tarek Malik, <laughs> editor in chief of space.com, the premier news hello. website. How are you, hello, Big T? Hello. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I fell off a skateboard last weekend, this past weekend, uh, Rod. So uh, forgive well, me if I'm a little banged up. But uh, aside from that, I'm ready to talk about space rocks and, and everything. So and it's well, great to and, see and, Jeff and, again or talk to Jeff again. Uh, thank it's you, been a long time. Say, Same here. <laughs> well, I'm really impressed. I mean, I know you're a very enthusiastic and active <laughs> gentleman and very energetic. I did not know that you were a skateboarder. So so you oh. yourself have experienced the, the forces that pull meteorites towards the Earth. Free fall. Yes, yeah. that's right. That's right. I got gravity and I are best friends. I, 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 I can tell you, I am not an avid skateboarder. Uh, I tried it at my daughter's Girl Scout camp and I fell twice. But that's great because I, I, I did was, it twice. I was going to predict it once. had something to do with trying to be a show off dad. <laughs> and now your daughter, of course, burying her head in shame every time somebody brings up, hey, remember when your dad went cartwheeling off that skateboard, which, by the way, reminds me of Andy Aldrin's story last week where he talked about, Jeffrey, this is for, for your benefit, we had Andy Aldrin on, and at, towards the end of the show, we talked about what he was thinking while he was watching his dad walk on the moon, and he said, you know, other people were thinking about danger and the possibility of death and all that. His biggest fear was the buzz would chip over a cable and embarrass him in front of his friends at school, <laughs> which I thought, <laughs> teenagers are always the same. All right. So we're here to talk about meteorites, what they are, where they come from, where they can be found on Earth, and all kinds of other things. But first, much to the surprise of Jeffrey Notkin, we have a couple of meteorite jokes. <gasps> ooh, 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 Excellent. I'm ready. I'm here for this. Let's go. <clears throat> okay. Hey, iPhone users, don't bother sending the meteor emoji to your Android friends. It won't have the same impact. <laughs> That's rather good, actually. <laughs> Did you oh, wait but no, better yet? Fraud. Better yet, I always I always go with the second one to cover the embarrassment of the yeah. first. Hey, can you just imagine how dinosaurs felt seeing that meteor entering the Earth's atmosphere? They were probably petrified. <laughs> wow, no, that's, a softer that definitely rim deserved shot. Okay. The, definitely deserved hey, the drum hit. Very appropriate for the debut of the new Jurassic Park or Jurassic World movie uh, this month. So, very appro- God, apropos. Was- Listen to you. You've been at space.com so long, you just have product placement in your blood. I like that. <laughs> so, uh, Rod, I've, I've got one for you. We, uh, I wanted to open a, a meteorite club on Mars because I thought it would be really way out, man. But in the end, I close, had to close it down because it somehow just didn't have the right atmosphere. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> oh, am I just the easy and, one? Because I love all these jumps in with the crickets. <laughs> All That's right, hey, we Those got some headlines. Crickets. Speaking of oh, meteorites, yes. or meteoroids right. in this case, because a, a meteorite is only a meteorite if it impacts Earth, correct, Jeffrey? That is absolutely correct. All right, so we had a micrometeoroid impact on the James Webb Space Telescope, which was expected, but not quite to the extent that it happened. So, Tarek, give us the deets. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, basically, uh, NASA's 10 billion dollar space telescope the james webb space telescope has been whacked by a bigger micrometeoroid than they expected now they they expect 
uh, that these space telescopes or anything in space is going to get dinged up by by little little tiny dust grains that are that are out there. And in fact, there were four other events that they were able to register on the giant mirror. I mean, this mirror is like twenty feet across or something like that. And oh, wow. uh, but. Yeah, there you go. And uh, 21.3, actually, if memory serves. And uh, sorry, but but this fifth one was like, it was much bigger than they were expecting. And so they're trying to like understand what is special about that one there. If it's something that, you know, uh, James Webb is about a million miles away out at the Lagrange point two on the opposite side of the uh, the earth from the sun. And they want to make sure that that, you know, it's a pretty safe place for it. And they think that it is. There's a lot of space out there. But, you know, it's only been a few a few months, not even a year, that it's been out there. And they want to make sure that they understand what that environment is like. So the thing that always puzzled me about this, and I see it's been the discussion in uh, a lot of uh, space, space-related space forums, is you're out at Lagrange 2, which is not a spot in space. It's an orbit beyond the moon, right? It keeps yeah. it in the sun's light. Otherwise, it would be in the moon's shadow. But it's an it's a, a spot of, of gravitational equilibrium that also tends to collect other stuff. So you'd think there would be a moderate amount of space junk there, right? Yeah, and there's actually a few other spacecraft there, too. Uh, China has uh, an old moon or, uh, spacecraft that they had uh uh, sent there uh, out there. There's at least one other European observatory, if memory serves, but they all have the same the same problem because that stuff's going to collect there. It's a stable gravitational point. You know, you have to right. orbit that that area. You can't just kind of stay parked forever. But you need very uh, much less propellant than you would if you were in a uh, a regular uh, orbit around the Earth, if you would, like the Hubble Space Telescope would need. Uh, and so, so that's that's is like a, a this is the biggest space telescope ever built with the biggest mirror surface ever assembled. It's got 18 different segments uh, that they've pieced together into this massive uh, deformable mirror to, to look back to the earliest epochs of the uh, of the universe. And so it's going to collect stuff. People, things are going to hit it, you know? And, uh, and so they did expect it, but this was a bigger one than they were really anticipating and a bit early in the mission. Now, they, they do expect they're going to get more. It's built to withstand that. They even shot simulated bits and micrometeoroids at it when it was on the ground. So they're not too worried about it, but they want to kind of get a baseline. Of, are these the, the size of impacts they're going to need to prepare for? And uh, do they have to figure out how that's going to change the lifetime expectancy of the of the space telescope? Right. I had a chance to inspect some micrometeoroid impacts uh, years ago when I was at the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show. A colleague of mine, a meteorite hunter, colleague, Peter Heidelor, who's uh, really an expert in gold nugget hunting, but has found a lot of meteorites in the course of his work, brought to the gem show to everyone's amazement a fuel tank from what, what we thought was a Russian salute. And it was a little bit bigger than a bowling ball. It was made out of titanium, had fallen to earth. So the front of it had melted. It really did look like an iron meteorite. And he, it was spectacular. And he goes, you yeah, haven't seen anything yet. Take this loop and have a look at the surface. And there were multiple tiny craters all, all over it. And you could see the little tiny splash rims around them. It was as if you were looking at a miniature meteor crater. It, it was fascinating. So I think it's inevitable if we leave hardware in space long enough, it's going to have these impacts. Yeah. And, you know, that during uh, in 2009, when the last mission to the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, Rod and Jeff, uh, the astronauts were there, they pulled off a big panel and they've been studying that. Uh, since then, because it is also just like peppered, uh, just as Jeff said, with these little tiny craters all over the front of the the, the exterior hatch uh, of that of that instrument there, which it was the the camera uh, door that they were uh, that they had pulled off there. So, you know, they're they're studying it, and it's not just uh, not just for uh, micrometeoroids, but it's also for any kind of debris that might be out there too. They want to know what that's going to do to the mirrors, to the uh, vehicles themselves. Well, and let's I talk if- about. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I, well, I wonder if some of that material could be lunar. So we know we have lunar meteorites on Earth that have been blasted off the surface of the moon. And the, the fragments, that they, they may travel around the moon for some time, and then they may get pulled into towards the Earth's gravitational pull. And they could, they could be up there for thousands or millions of years before they make it to Earth. So it's possible that those are little tiny moon rocks that are hitting it also, given its location, I'm guessing. That's right. That's right. You, you heard that. that. He said that the moon is attacking the James Webb Space Telescope because, <laughs> as we saw in Moonfall, 
it's a mega structure and there's aliens inside. They're going to come okay, get us all. Okay. Right, right, Stop. Right, right, right. Stop. Don't mention that <laughs> god awful movie. And speaking of sci fi, bad sci fi in particular, all this talk about uh, meteorites is, is reminding me of all those 1950s, 1960s movies where. If if I think Jeffrey probably remembers the original Lost in Space, where the prop men dropped crumpled up balls of tinfoil <laughs> on the spacecraft because that's what meteorites look like. All right, sorry, meteorites. Oh God, I that was a cardinal sin. Next story, <laughs> NASA's UFO panel. So we had a recent press conference with NASA that was kind of underwhelming uh, about the UAP phenomenon, the new name for UFOs. Uh, Unidentified, Un unidentified aerial, aerial phenomena. Phenomenon, right. right. And this came after the report that was issued, I think, late last year, if I remember correctly, which was uh, a full nine pages of the couple hundred pages that the report actually ran, but the rest of it was redacted. And that was even more underwhelming, but that came from the military, so you expect that. So, uh, Tarek, you, you, you followed this... Um, this presser, what did we learn? Well, uh, I was uh, very quick to put my tinfoil hat on so that the, <laughs> the the aliens didn't 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 figure out what we were thinking. But yeah, so this is really interesting because uh, normally when NASA announces they're going to have a press conference, there is a little bit of flair, a little bit of pomp. They put out a press release really, um, uh, you know, really early in advance, and this was really like a thing. secret. Yeah, so there was a meeting of the National Academies, their, their sciences board this week. And uh, yeah. the chief of NASA Science Directorate, uh, Dr. Thomas Zerbukin, was scheduled to speak there. And the night before, the afternoon before, uh, we all got a, a note that said, hey, he's going to speak there. He's going to give an update of all of the science missions, including one particular update in which we'll have to elaborate with a press conference later. So, of course, we're all wondering, what are they going to say? You know, has a science mission died? There's some spacecraft that have problems. But no, it was the fact that NASA is assembling a crack team of, of scientists to basically look at the science behind these, these uh, unexplained aerial phenomena that the, the U.S. military has been, has been tracking. There was a... Uh, I guess you could say it's an infamous <laughs> report of of the U.S. Navy, you know, logging all of these these sightings that their their pilots have been seeing that they really can't uh, can't explain, and having a whole kind of separate study going on. Now NASA has said that right now there is no evidence at all that any of these these UAPs, that, you know, it really is a synonym for UFOs. Anything that's unknown and flying up there is 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 a is a UFO, right? Because it's an unknown flying object, unidentified flying object. Right. But they, they're saying very specifically, there's no evidence that it's aliens. They said in their press release, there is no evidence that this is extraterrestrial in origin. Uh, so they want to kind of come out there and make it plain. But what they are doing is funding for $100,000, a, a panel that's going to start a meeting in the fall to look 100, at- 100,000 whole dollars? That's right. That's right. That's right. Gee not a whiz. lot. That's not a lot. Golly by golly, that's a lot for government money. Huh? But they're going to look at any kind of scientific explanation of these sightings that the the military pilots have been seeing, uh, and that uh, uh, that they can look at with their own sensors and whatnot. You know, and chances are these are all just airplanes that people didn't know was up there, or uh, or other kinds of tests that some pilots may not have been privy to know were going on at that point in time. But this is or bad the latest. Guys. Don't forget <laughs> or, the bad or that's, guys. Or you, they could be, they could be UFOs. They could be actual aliens. We don't, we don't know. I didn't mean but, those bad universe. guys. I meant the ones across the ocean. But yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so, so that's kind of what this is. They're they're assembling a, a team of uh, of scientists. They NASA kind of wants to take the stigma off of uh, the the UFO term. You know, to say, hey, we're just going to look at it. We're going to say it. And you know, we've seen this before with the government investigated sightings and whatnot with Project Blue Book way back when with and Roswell. Uh, and so the the hope is that this is gonna maybe maybe take the 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 weirdness away from it and add some hey yeah we know it's these are just airplanes uh, that more people are seeing because there's more people watching right now. I, I remember being eight years old when Project Blue Book came out and calling BS on it then even as a little kid <laughs> it was obvious. But that but was the autopsy uh, course, video. You've seen well, it, right? It was, 
<laughs> yeah, but, but that oh, was yeah. famous. Actually, I was working for the History Channel when that came out. But uh, the Blue Book was famously, you know, the origin of a lot of talk about swamp gas, weather balloons, and you know, planetary farts and things like that. And it's like, come on, you guys, really? You expect us to buy that? All right, but we have other things to talk about, so we'll be back in a moment after this quick break. And we are back with Jeffrey Notkin, one of the original hello, hello. meteorite men. So, Jeff, um, let's start with a little bit about where one finds meteorites, what they are, and why they're worth so much money. I do know a few things about this, Rod. Thank you for asking. <laughs> having, been, having devoted most of the last three decades to solving these very perplexing and specific questions, one of the things that fascinates and enthralls me the most is there's no particular place on Earth where meteorites like to fall. And I'm frequently asked it at public events when, I, when I'm doing outreach or whatever, is there a special place where meteorites fall? Are they attracted to the equator or is it they're attracted to Antarctica? Is that why there are so many in Antarctica? And no, that is not the case. Meteorites fall randomly over the surface of our Earth. They could fall anywhere, anytime. And so when you think that through to the end, you realize that most of the meteorites that fall will never find because they land in the oceans or in jungles and will be lost forever. What makes it seem like certain areas attract meteorites is that the conditions are much more favorable for preserving them after they fall and for finding them if you are looking for them as I do. So let's, let's take that explanation a little bit further. The vast majority of meteorites, almost all the meteorites that we know, with very few exceptions, contain iron. And that would be at the low end, maybe 20% in stone meteorites and chondrites, up to more than 90% in the, in the nickel iron family of meteorites. So we all know what happens when you leave a favorite tool out in the garden for a few weeks, especially if that you're doing that in England, where I grew up, or New York, where I used to live, or some place that has a lot of rainfall, things will oxidize. So iron-rich meteorites fall uniformly over the surface of the earth. Many are lost in the oceans. And those that land in moist environments are going to decay more quickly than the others. What that means is if we go to very old landscapes, some examples would be the Atacama Desert in Chile, the Australian Outback, dry hot deserts of Northwest Africa, some of the deserts in the Middle East, especially in Oman. These areas have produced lots of meteorites and Antarctica, of course, which is also a desert, even though it surely doesn't look like one when you're sitting in the Southwest deserts. <laughs> so meteorites will accumulate in areas where they can be preserved. And if you find a particularly old surface, it's estimated that some of the exposed surfaces in the Atacama Desert are about a million years old. Meteorites that have fallen during that last million years will presumably still be there. And so your odds are much better at finding them. How does that sound? Does that, does that get you enthusiastic about getting your magnet well, and heading can, out into can, the wilds? Can, can I ask, can I, and this, this might be like a really silly question, Jeff, but like, what, what, what are they? I mean, do we, do we, why do we really care? Are they treasures of the solar system? Are they the trash what left over question. from the birth of our planets? <laughs> I mean, well, like, I love that. Uh, I love, Tarek, I love it that you get right down to the crux of the matter. So I've described them as both. I've described meteorites as treasure. They're, they're tremendously valuable to science. They're financially valuable to collectors. But if you're, if you're practical about it, they are also the cast off cosmic debris of the solar system that landed here by accident. And I used to do, a, a, I spoke at Edinburgh Fringe Festival, did a, did a, a performance piece about my my life in meteorite hunting and adventure science and called it I was a celestial rubbish collector because <laughs> the, the, it's, it's what it is I mean it, it's it's broken fragments of asteroids and moons and planets that have landed here on earth but there there are these there's this combination of factors so we humans like to collect things and for whatever reason we're drawn to things that are scarce why are emeralds more valuable than quartz or jade? Because there's less of it. Is, is an emerald really that much more beautiful than a peridot gemstone? 
they look pretty similar to me. It's the it's the rarity, it's the scarcity that drives the fascination of collectors. So we have material that is extremely rare, some of it beautifully shaped and with desirable features. And also many meteorites have an unusual history attached, it was part of a, a, a shower that formed a huge crater field in Russia, or was part of a meteorite that hit a car in Peekskill, New York in the 1990s, that kind of thing. But for me, it's the, the possibility of holding and interacting with a part of the cosmos. Those of us who love astronomy and support spaceflight, we spend most of our time looking, looking at things that have happened in the past in astronomy or watching launches, watching space programs. So we're, in a sense, bystanders. We're observers, most of us. We observe astronomy from a great distance. When we get the chance to study meteorites, in a sense, we're observing the tangible offspring of astronomy up close, right in front of us. And if, if, to take it a step further, in scientific terms, studying meteorites in, in the short term specifically teaches us about the parent bodies they come from so we can learn about asteroids and from the the few meteorites we have that have come from the moon and mars they teach us more about those bodies but big picture it helps us understand our place in the solar system helps with with composition with with aging with the the age of the solar system how the different planetary bodies have involved evolved so those are my those are my attempt attempted articulate explanations but if the simple answer is who wouldn't be fascinated by <laughs> strange melted weird rocks that have fallen from space and landed on earth usually somehow in very inconvenient places that i need to travel to at great expense and hopefully a bit of danger so i get a good story out of it so <laughs> well the full spectrum you've, you've given me the perfect segue here because i do want to talk more about the science but uh, speaking of dangerous, weird places, you did three seasons of a show called Meteorite Men for, I believe it was a science channel, correct? Correct. Yes, sir. Started on science, but it's it's aired all over the world now. Right. And it's it's still viewable and it's a lot yes, of fun. Yes, it's enjoying it's, a resurgence on Curiosity and Pluto and other stations yeah, in glorious HD. Pluto with, with minimal commercial breaks, thank God. And uh, you and Steve Arnold tromp around the world looking for meteorites. So... Maybe you can give us just kind of a uh, an expanded TV guide summary of one of your weirder adventures, because you did a lot of really fun and interesting things in that show. Oh, we sh we surely did. And I have to take issue with the word trump. I, I think Steve's a big, strong guy. Maybe he trumps, but I think I more skip across the surface of the earth with my <laughs> enthusiasm and looking for space I rocks. I think you I'm glide. I, oh, glide. thanks. Yeah. Glide to the top of the mountain with my metal detector in one hand and, and pickaxe in the other. Well, I, I could... I could I could fill the hour with with bullet points of of the strangest adventures like being dropped into a 35 million year old crater in Siberia from an ex-military Russian helicopter which then didn't come to pick us up and we were there oh, no. we were there for 9 Oops. days. There was once a drinking competition uh, with Russians in the Arctic Circle which I just definitely uh, would not recommend uh, anyone <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it, it did. It did end up with me in the river at about three o'clock in the morning. I'm not proud of that, but that was just I, the, I strange that, things happen. That put you off vodka for a while, I assume. Yes. Oh, yes. 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 That was the end of my uh, definitely the end of my vodka oh. drinking days. That, but I can say that a, I. Must, I I was going to say, it must have been a really great meteorite to get you in that river at three in the morning, right? Well, it was actually, a, it was a challenge from my, from my Russian colleagues on the, on the meteorite crater expedition that, that said that Anglo-Americans weren't as tough as the Russians. And I foolishly said I would do anything that they could do. And it did get a bit out of hand. Um, anyway, it, that sort of thing builds character and it was a success. I would just agree expedition. with them in that case, but I'm, I'm glad you, you <clears> took one for the team. I appreciate it. Well, that. I do now. I do now. And in fact, at the end of that marvelous expedition, this three week expedition in Siberia, I've become very friendly with with my Russian colleagues. And I speak a little bit of Russian, not not much, but enough to, you know, chit chat. And when we were all shaking hands and saying goodbye, it was a very heartfelt goodbye. And I said, I, I, I need to tell you guys that I'm I'm thankful, more than thankful. I'm I, I'm so relieved 
that the United States never went to war with Russia because you guys are really tough and, and resilient and uh, we, should, we should be friends. So we, we did our bit for international relations. Okay, here's, here's a favorite weird story for you. I was hunting in Kansas with, with my great friend and, and Meteorite Men co-star Steve Arnold. We were in a field in Kiowa County, west of Wichita, where we had found several large meteorites over the, over the previous year. And we're using a very large detector that we tow behind a vehicle. And you've, you've seen me on the show with the, the little handheld detectors, and we've all seen the old guys out on the beach with their, with their detectors looking for lost jewelry and that sort of thing. The trouble with those detectors is their range is, is very shallow. You might, you might find a good target 18 inches underground if you're very lucky. What it boils down to is the, the bigger a coil you have, the deeper into the ground it can see. And as a bonus, you're covering an enormous area when you're towing a detector that's the size of, I don't know, eight or 10 pool tables. It was gigantic. <laughs> so we we got a real, Steve and I are both in the cab of the of the truck and, and you've seen us do this on Meteorite. And we actually, we actually weren't filming this day. We, were, we would sometimes go ahead and scout targets. So the show was was extremely authentic. We didn't plant meteorites, we didn't bury meteorites. This is my profession, it's my calling, it's my passion. I, I said at the beginning when we were in negotiations, if we did the show, I wanted it to be real. And and thankfully we had a great production company and, and a great network and they, they felt the same way. They wanted to make a real adventure show with serious science content in it. So television, is very expensive, especially when you're in the wilderness and you've got a crew of maybe 14 people. And so to save time, we would sometimes, Steve and I would fly ahead of the crew, maybe we'd be two or three days ahead, and we'd we'd get the equipment figured out, we'd get our detectors calibrated, we'd just get the feeling of the land and go, wow, that looks good over there, we think this area's been hunted, this area's got a lot of trash. And we'd fire up the detectors and we'd do some preliminary scans. And if we if we found a target, we would we would mark it and we would come back another day and, and dig it. So this day, this particular day, we, that's what we were doing. We, we were out scouting and we got this really loud target. It, it howls when you go over something large with the big metal detector. So, well, that sounds good. So we get out, move the detector, go in with the smaller detectors to try and pinpoint it. The, there, was, there was something strange about this target, the sound was different from what we usually expect. And it's surprising, it's almost like a musician, your ears get attuned to a certain thing and like, I don't know, it's just, it just sounds odd. And also the modern detectors that we have, have a, have a digital readout on them, which indicates what kind of metal it could be. And this was way off where it should be. And Steve and I both said, Dah, let's, let's just dig it. Uh, it's, it's, I don't think it's gonna be a meteorite. Let's just <laughs> dig it, we'll get it out of the field and we won't, wait, we won't waste camera time. So we did, and it's, it's this thick clayish Kansas soil. It's rich farming soil. That's why there's so many farms in, in Kansas. The ground is great for growing crops, quite hard to dig in. And you know how when you dig, you, you move some dirt and then you jump in the hole and you loosen it up and you dig and you jump out of the hole. And, and this happened a few times and we're in the process of doing this. And the entire bottom of the hole just disappeared into this howling blackness. And there was this, <laughs> this, this sound like, like a monster or a demon oh, sighing like this. All the angst of the underworld was burst up out of this <laughs> hole in the ground. And I jumped at so far, if only I'd been in the Olympics or had been filmed, and then I just ran to the nearest cover and, and jumped and turned and looked and Steve's just standing there laughing in hysterics and he goes, man, I did not know that you could travel that fast. That was really <laughs> impressive. And it was an uncapped well, an ancient well oh. in the middle of this field. And we are so lucky that we didn't fall into it because we could have just gone with the soil when, when, it, when it went. So ever since then, whenever I'm digging a target, I'm way more cautious and I never jumped down into the hole. Now, I seem to recall uh, a, a more explosive story, a potentially more explosive story in your past. You know where I'm, where I'm oh, going with this? Oh, I know. What you, so you're talking about when we were searching for the Utah Fireball. 
Well, this was in season two of, of Meteorite Men. And it's one of the really interesting things about doing a show like that. We have a, we have a schedule. We go, okay, we're going to do these eight episodes in this season. We're going to go to these 14 locations. And it involves a lot of travel and planning. It's not just the two of us, but it's our director, our field producer, the crew. We need to have accommodations. We have to make appointments with local experts. In some cases, we had to have survival guides like in Australia. We needed to have a doctor with us in Chile in the Australian outback because these places were so remote. So we're in the middle of filming and there's an enormous fireball that's seen over Salt Lake City by hundreds or thousands of people. And one of the most difficult things when, when there is a new fireball event, a large fireball is called a bolide, is to track where it went. Now, you gentlemen know that this, this, this thing we see, this humorous thing that we see in a lot of sci-fi and space movies where the, the meteorite fireball comes right into the ground when it's burning and boom, and there's a huge explosion. So that's not what happens. Fireballs do not land on Earth, except in the cases of the most enormous incoming potential meteorites. The, the encounter with Earth's atmosphere by meteoroids, which is a potential meteorite, that's what we call the rock when it's still traveling above the Earth. It doesn't become a meteorite until it hits. So the further these meteoroids zoom into our atmosphere, the more dense the atmosphere becomes and, and it, it crushes the atmosphere ahead of it. It slows down and then it just falls. So the fireball period ends when these potential meteorites are still many miles up in the air. And then they fall to Earth in what's called dark flight. So they're just rocks. They're just rocks falling out of the air. <laughs> and usually they're not particularly large. So how do you track them? Well, it's extremely difficult. We gather eyewitness reports. And in some cases, like with the, with the Utah fireball, hmm. there was good video footage. And so we were able to triangulate really well. And guess where it had landed? in one of the most perfect and wished for ideal meteorite hunting locations, the light colored, dry, flat salt beds of Utah. Very, very, close, to the, very close to the racetrack. So that was the good part. We thought, ah, the only time in our lives we're going to be able to get to this pristine, untouched strewn, strewn field and theoretically map the size distribution falls full location of every single stone and get a perfect picture of a strewn field. The unfortunate part of it was the landing site was right in the middle of the top secret Dugway military <laughs> testing ground, which even the military call Area 52. So we had to go all the way to the Pentagon to get permission to go out there. We finally did. We made several trips. We had, when, we re when we did get out there, we, we had an armed Marine Guard escort we had two unexploded ordnance guys and the director of the whole facility. And the ordnance guys were excited. They were glad to be out there because it's like they're being reunited with all their old friends. They go, oh, look, there's a piece of the XZ-15 and look, oh, look, there's a nasty thing over there. And they go, do not touch anything that you see out here. And there's bits of missiles and parachutes and fins and all kinds of crazy stuff. And it's not 20 minutes and Steve walks up to me and he's holding this bit of a rocket and he goes, hey, Jeff, look at this. Well, I go, didn't, didn't the guys just say don't touch anything? This is all unexploded army stuff. And he goes, oh, well, I thought they meant anything, you know, unexploded. And I go, well, how do you know it's not unexploded? It's all top secret <laughs> stuff. So anyway, we got, we got so close. We were so close. We, we, but we felt that we could see the zone where the meteorites had landed and the, the two unexploded ordnance guys go, go, okay, that's it. We go, what do you mean that's it? You said we could have the whole day. And they go, oh yeah, we have time. It's just, nobody goes any further than this. It's just too dangerous. They tested nerve gas out there and this and that and things we're not allowed to tell you about. And so we almost made it. And you know what? Those meteorites are still out there. No, one, no, one's, no, one's, no one's been out there. No, no one would go out there. Even, when the bomb, when the unexploded bomb guys say it's too dangerous, that's a good time to just once in your life listen to advice. But we didn't give up. We, after that, we got in our truck and we drove the entire perimeter of the Dugway, which it's enormous. 
It's larger than Rhode Island, if I remember correctly. <laughs> and Eisenhower yeah. founded it during World War II. And they built replicas of towns out there and tested incendiary bombs. And they were practicing the best way to destroy select areas of civilization. So there's all kinds of fascinating debris out there. Anyway, the conclusion of the story is we, we decided to continue our reconnaissance, even though we didn't think there were any meteorites outside of the testing range, we might as well. So we followed that perimeter fence, just the two of us, for several days. And on about the third day, I'm standing in the back of the pickup truck with my binoculars, looking for dark rocks on the, on the, on the, light, the light salt flats. And the vehicle slows. And Steve, I go, what's happening? And Steve goes, hey, Jeff, look at this. And so I, I look over to the east side and there is an enormous unexploded bomb or missile, just, just giant. And so we stop the truck, we get out, we've got, we've got to take pictures of this. So I have this photo of me crouched behind this enormous warhead. And we were very amused by, wow, you know, isn't it funny, haha, that it's outside of the testing range? It's about <laughs> maybe 50 feet outside of the perimeter fence of this, this gigantic testing range. So we, when we were done for that day, we GPSed it and we, we called our liaison there at the base and said, uh, hey, we found this, uh, this really <laughs> enormous, really enormous bomb. And they said, okay, we'll take care of it. And, and they said, you didn't go anywhere near it, did you? And we went, no, Probably with a two or three feet. We're, yeah. we're not stupid. That's, I mean, I'm crouching behind it with my hands out, like, look at this thing that I found. And so, so we said, no, we would never do that. But, I mean, in case we run across another one, why would, why would you not do that? And so the expert said, oh, well, some of them are very sensitive. They've got these timers and sensors and things in them. And, you know, if two guys in army boots with pickaxes hike up and start poking it and taking photos, it might just go off. So we go, oh, well, yeah, good to know for future. And then Steve, <laughs> Steve followed up and we were told later. So they said it was a 2000 pound unexploded Vietnam era warhead. And it was so dangerous. They blew it up on the spot. They didn't try wow. moving it. Wow. <laughs> I probably well shouldn't have really done that, but. Uh, it is one of my favorite photos. I included it in my book, my uh, How to Find Treasure from Space, my guide to meteorite hunting in this bit about <laughs> meteor wrongs, because people always say, often say, what's the most unusual thing you've ever found when hunting? And, and I always say, well, Steve Arnold, easily the most unusual, <laughs> but uh, followed by the 2000 pound bomb just outside the secret testing range. It almost well, makes and you believe in UFOs. <laughs> and and I, sh I should have mentioned your book because it is a, a fun read and it's a great way to learn more about uh, if, if one is is so compelled about how you might go about doing this yourself. I know we've got a lot more questions, Tarek, but I just for a moment here want to go uh, to a quick commercial break and then we'll be right back. All right, Tarek, I, th I can see you're burning with a question. Oh, my God, he's got to. I'm just. I, I, I'm <laughs> Good just, not just a question, but a product this, placement. Look at that. Oh, this, my this gosh. Is, Tarek is holding up a first edition of Meteorite Hunting going back my, many years. That was my very first book, Tarek. I need to send says, you the... It says, for Tarek, a pleasure to meet you at ISDC in 2014. So that, that tells oh, you. Oh, wow. I remember it well. Gosh, that's a really now good way of keeping track of your life, isn't it? If you gave a book to every interesting person that you met and dated it, then whenever we said, oh, how long has it been since we last hung out? Oh, let me just look in your book. Oh, 2014. Well done, well played, the, sir. For, for, the, for the record, Jeff just yeah. called me interesting, Rod. So just so that we've got that on, on, on the camera. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet you no, for your I, chair, buddy. I, uh, I, I, I bring the book out because you said two things that I wanted to ask about. Number one is the fact that there are three different names for rocks from space. And I, I did want to ask why we even have that. You said, you know, they're meteoroids when they're in space, which apparently they don't like the James Webb Space Telescope, like we heard earlier. And then when they're in the air, they're the meteors that we see for all the meteor showers. And then when they're on the ground, they're meteorites. So why do we have three different words for what is just the, the same rock? in different parts of its journey because I don't have the same word for me. I, don't, I just got the one name when I'm here or on a plane or at my destination. Oh, that's, yes, well, that's a good analysis, Tarek. I will say I really love it when I'm asked a question that I've never been asked before. So I do get asked, 
can you explain the difference between the three? But I've never asked, I've never been asked, why do we have three? So we are talking about three completely separate things. And, and, and let's go backwards. So when, when a piece of cosmic material lands on Earth, lands, it is then a meteorite. It's a, it's a physical object, like quartzite. It's a, it's a rock. It happens to be a rock from space. So it's a tangible object that made it to the surface of the Earth. On the way in, we see an aerial phenomenon. We see a fireball, or also called a shooting star, a, sm a, or a smaller version of the same thing. A giant fireball is called a bolide. So meteor refers to the atmospheric phenomenon, not the rock making it. It is that flash in the sky is a meteor. So when people call me very enthusiastically and say, oh, I was watching the Perseids last night and one of the meteors landed in my driveway and I found it, I've got it, I found a meteor. And I, I would never laugh in someone's face, but I laugh amusedly to myself because you couldn't get a meteor. You couldn't have one. It's a, it's a brief, temporary atmospheric phenomenon. Okay, so we've got meteorite and meteor. What is it that makes the atmospheric phenomenon? There is a rock coming in. I know I'm being very highly technical here. This is actually almost like grammar. Now make sure you use proper <laughs> capitalization and punctuation. What is the thing, the object that's making the meteor? It's a physical body. It's, it's hurtling through the air. It's compressing the atmosphere in front of it, generating heat, which causes the ablation and, and, what, and the, what looks like flame. It's a rock, and that rock that is not yet a meteorite, but is causing the meteor, is called a meteoroid. Mm. Right. Most of them come from the surface of an asteroid. So the life story is asteroid, meteoroid, meteor, meteorite. Wow. Are you now Try more saying that confused? Like, <laughs> and, I got it. And I that's it. probably... <laughs> One of the well, meteor stories it, I've heard all day. Oh, uh, nice one. And I thought oh, you were a vegetarian. I I, <laughs> uh, not a chance. So I look like that's a why the astronomer. That's why the astronomer sent his salad back, Rod, because he wanted something meteor. He wanted right? something meteor, yeah. <laughs> but no, it's wrong. <laughs> oh, right? that's he wanted the best oh. so far. <laughs> oh, that was the, I was in episode one, I think, Rod. Uh, yeah, that was like. I only know uh, two jokes. With, with the lame so jokes it must have, headlining. It must have driven you crazy, Jeff. Uh, watching Smallville, that that Superman preview where they just kept calling the, <laughs> the meteor rocks for like seven seasons. So, yeah, <laughs> well, you you see it a lot. You see it a lot on television and 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 films also. And I I used to cringe, and now I realize it's one of those things that we're probably just never going to be able to to get. Although this harkens back to the news story, I was very amused when you were talking about the UFO conference and how well. Let's see, we're going to address this problem by renaming the thing. <laughs> that, that just sounds like something out of right. like a Monty Python sketch. Well, we don't like hats, so we're now going to call them dogs. So instead of calling them UFOs, we're going to call them UAPs. It just sounds like a very governmental thing to do. Yes, we will solve the Doesn't problem it? by recategorizing it and having a conference about it. I'm not diminishing, and I think it's great that they're trying to bring some scientific explanation to this thing that's bothered most people for most of their lives, what's actually going on with, with UFOs. So uh, good luck to them. I will say The Atlantic has a terrific article about this and the, the, the lead image is marvelous. It's a silhouette of a person holding up a beaker a chemistry beaker, and it's got a green flying saucer in it, as if we are now focusing all science attention on the UFO problem. Well, good, <laughs> they should, because if uh, if everybody from fire chiefs and commercial pilots to astronauts think they've seen something in the sky that they can't explain, they should look into it. Oh, yes. <laughs> there it is. Well done. We're, we're so, seeing it on our screen. Well done. That was Gosh, that was fast. You must have a real so, professional uh, team. Oh, we show. do. We and, and I've got a whole boatload of questions, and I'm sure Tarek's got a few too, but I want to make sure we get to this before we get to, well, things like your career in punk rock. Um, <laughs> it, it, one of the things that it took me years to understand about uh, meteorites is that you can actually define where a number of them came from. From when I, So when I was very young, we had the Enbid Scientific Catalog, and they used to advertise tektites, rocks from the moon, which I guess turned out to be not entirely accurate. And I'm sure you know all about that. But we do find that some meteorites come from 
the moon and Mars. So you actually have, in effect, a little sample of that, that body, correct? That is absolutely correct. And and you're also correct on the on the old tektite theory. So an early theory was that tektites were were volcanic material that had been ejected from ancient volcanoes on the moon and, and landed on Earth. And that is no longer a widely held theory. We now believe with a high degree of certainty that tektites are impactites. They are they are terrestrial material that was altered by a gigantic and ancient meteorite impact oh. some somewhere in the Far East. And so the tektites are are melted earth rock, soil, various things melted by the impact. But in, in the particular case of, of the of the widely found Indochinite tektites that are found over from from Thailand and Cambodia all the way into the Australian outback gives you gives you a si- an idea of the size this impact must have been because it threw material thousands of miles away from its impact site and I found them in Australia myself when I was hunting there so they were thrown so far up into the atmosphere that they fell back down and some of them experienced ablation in a sense becoming meteorites themselves and it mm. they are a fantastic phenomenon but Yes, sorry, I, I got a little bit sidetracked because I'm fascinated by impactites as well. Impactites, the the residue of enormous meteorite impacts on Earth. And in many instances, craters that I visited, such as Papagai in Siberia and the Alamo Breccia in the Great Basin in, in Nevada and many others, there are no meteorites left because the, the impact occurred so many millions of years ago, all of the materials weathered away. But what mm. is left are the Earth rocks that were crushed and melted and deformed. And in the case of the Papagai crater in Siberia, diamonds were formed by, by the impact. Wow. The, wow. The, the Russians, it was a top secret site for decades. And when I visited there in 99, I had to get a stamped permit from the KGB to go there. And I was with the first <laughs> that, I, man, I so wanted to keep that. And I, I was grilled by oh, security boy. on the way in. And they go, when you leave, you keep this in passport. You keep... When you leave country, you surrender. Or you will. You will not leave. You will not leave without surrender document. Understand? <laughs> and I go, yes, sir. I understand that loud and clear, sir. Thank you very much. And the whole time I'm looking at, I'm coveting it. I'm going KGB stamp. Is there a way I can <laughs> smuggle this out? But no, I I tried to forget about it too, and I gave them the, my passport without the form of leaving from Moscow at the end. And they go, where is where is form? Where is where is security <laughs> form? And I go, oh, sorry, right here. Didn't mean to be. Don't want to end up in Gulag Archipelago for losing a bit of paperwork. <clears throat> so I uh, completely lost my train of thought there, just just that, thinking wistfully about KGB documents. You know, who, who knew well, they that? They throw you back into an icy river, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, well, then that also was the same trip with uh, jumping in the river. Yes, of course. That's ah. probably why I can't remember anything from, <laughs> from that. So, <laughs> So we were we were talking about impactites and tektites. Yes. So the a lot of my expeditions have been to investigate and uh, study and in in excellent and ideal cases camp on the floor of craters. So I've I've managed to sleep overnight on the floor of three different meteorite craters and I hope to add to that list although it's not an easy thing uh to arrange in most cases. <clears throat> Sometimes Did that include dangerous. Behringer? No, I wish. I've been down to the floor of 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 what's also known as as Meteor Crater, the famous crater, beautiful yeah. gorgeous crater in northern Arizona. So it it's uh, you there are instances when people are allowed down onto the floor of the crater. It's quite an arduous hike and there is a lot of old mining equipment and a crashed aircraft and a really strange cutout kind of dummy of an astronaut and other weird stuff at the bottom of the crater. It's almost like going to another planet or uh, some sort of surrealistic experience when when you get down there, but it, it's it's a wonderful experience. I filmed there many times, and we were shooting an episode of STEM Journals, and we were allowed down on the floor of the crater. We were actually doing a show about atmospheric sciences, not meteorites, but it was That's a they marvelous filmed. experience. Yeah, they filmed Starman there with Jeff Bridges way back. That's then. absolutely correct. Yes, and the great Gene Schumacher trained some of the Apollo astronauts there prior to the Apollo missions. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, my, my, my big question was to kind of lead on all of these great hunting expeditions. And I'm wondering, because I know that there might be some listeners who want to know how they can go find some or how they can collect them if it's going to, you know, be buying them somewhere or what. And so I'm wondering if there's three 
main tips that you might have for a listener about what to I have a tip. When, <laughs> I have a Roger. tip. Go to Jeffrey's auction <laughs> at Heritage Auctions, yeah. which is going on right now, because rather than stumbling around as I would, perhaps as Steve Arnold might, stumbling around in the wilderness looking for something that's very hard to find, you can just go buy one that's already been found and categorized and made all pretty and everything. Okay, and sorry, one I just of my, to make sure I got that in there. Well, thank you. And it, it, <laughs> no, it, it is true. I, we'll come back to that. I, I'm, I'm after 28 years of meteorite hunting on six, finding meteorites on six continents, I'm, I'm selling my personal collection at auction uh, through Heritage on June 22nd. And what you said, Rod, is absolutely true. I, you don't have to buy a meteorite. You have to buy a meteorite from an auction to, to accomplish this. But, but the essence of what you're saying is you need to familiarize yourself with what meteorites look like. And when I started meteorite hunting almost 30 years ago, well, it was, it was 28 years ago that I found my first meteorite. So I, I'd been interested in this subject, fiendishly interested in it since I was a kid. And I spent a lot of time in museums looking at meteorites. And don't necessarily get fixated on the beautiful, pretty ones that have been cleaned and put on nice stands and cut open to show their interior, because that's not what they look like in the field. You want to look at uncleaned meteorites as found in situ to really understand. So uh, some ways you could do that are to buy a small uncleaned meteorite. There, uh, there's, uh, there's an abundance of specimens out, out there in the world and from a, buy from a reputable dealer that has an established a history so that you know you're getting an authentic thing and and research familiarize understand what are, what are meteorites made of where do they come from how do they acquire these colors and it it is the iron content in meteorites that causes those that have been lying on the surface of our planet for a long time to oxidize and and take on what is commonly a, a reddish bronze color a natural patina as that iron content slowly oxidizes. And I'm saying this objectively. I'm not trying to plug my book or my video. I have been asked this question a hundred million times since I started doing this because people watch Meteorite Men or they've seen one of my presentations or they've been to one of the big meteorite auctions and they get excited and they go, well, I want to do that. How do you, how do, you do that? How do you find a meteorite? So when Steve and I started doing this, there was no meteorite hunting club. There was no guide. There was no book. There was nobody to tell you how to do it. We had to figure it all out. <clears throat> and so I've, I've written a couple of books on the subject. Tarek has the, the very first one. And the, there's a, I, I revised it, rewrote and expanded it a couple of years ago, and it's called How to Find Treasure from Space, The Expert Guide to Meteorite Hunting. And I really wanted to put my knowledge into a book so that people who seriously want to understand how to undertake this most challenging of exploits would, it, would at least have the correct information. And numerous times since these books have been published, I've received an email from someone with a photograph of a real meteorite. And it, and the e email is something like, I can't believe it. I found my own first meteorite. I read your book and I went out and I hunted and it took me a year, but I did it. <laughs> and that is such a joyous occasion for me because in a small way, I helped somebody's dream come true. So we learned by doing. We, ex we found this magnet works better for this type of meteorite. This detector is better in this environment. There's no point in looking inside meteorite craters because the explosion has thrown all the fragments outside of the crater. So there was no, there was no source that you could go to to find out this information when we started decades ago. And I, I felt like sharing it. And, and after Meteorite Men, the show was such a success, I felt an obligation, actually, a happy obligation, because people contacted us in the thousands or tens of thousands and said, I love this. I want to do that. How do I do that? What do I need? What detector should I use? Where should I go? Do you know a good place is another question <laughs> I get asked all the time. And I say, if I knew a good place, I would be there. Now, I would be there now with my detector. We went to all the good places that we could on Meteorite Men. And those sites, that some of those, particularly in, in, the, in the first season, were, were favorite places that we had gone over the years on our own. We had permission from the landowners or whatever the circumstance was. And 
we knew that if we went and we hunted for a few days or a week or sometimes two weeks, we'd find a meteorite. We, we knew there were still meteorites there. Not anymore. <laughs> when, you, when you film a television show at a spot and you say where it is, we went back next year and there was nothing left. It was like it had been cleaned by little tiny robot vacuum cleaners searching for every minute piece. And, and God bless people for going out. And, and so many times on Facebook, someone would message me direct on Facebook and they go, oh, I figured out where you were and I found a gold basin or I found a, a dry lake bed meteorite. And that's what it's all about. We, if we wanted to keep it all secretive and cliquey, we wouldn't have done a show about it. And it's not just the the adventures that we had in the educational content that we were able to pass along to other people and, and laughs and a, a sense of joy and adventure, I hope. But many, many new meteorites were found because of the show. Many, some of them quite important. So people would watch the show and go, oh, that's what meteorites look like. And, and you know, I think we've, uh, didn't dad find something like that on the farm once? And and people would would go, well, we always had that strange rock that was, it was pulled out of the driveway when the house was being built. Didn't it stick to a magnet? And so this happened over and over and over and over again. And some of the meteorites that were found were completely new to science and unique and somewhat important. And so a fun show that was meant to have us uh, as much science content, can, content as we could manage without, without turning people off actually contributed to the all of the knowledge of meteorites in history. And for a... For a science nerd and rascal adventurer like me, it was a huge honor to think that we were we were doing what we would have done anyway, but on a larger scale because we had the support of Discovery Communications behind us. But but good came out of it. It wasn't just an adventure show. Real knowledge was gained. And people's lives were changed. I know I could I could introduce you to multiple people who either watched the show or met us at a convention and I, I put a little meteorite in their hand and it cha they changed their career. And there's several people who are PhD meteorite scientists now because they watched the show 10 years ago or came to a convention and, and I let them hold a bit of the moon. So hmm. some people's lives were actually changed by it, which is phenomenal That's for television, cool. really. Yeah, that was cool. you know, can I, can I, I feel like we could, we could talk. So I have so many more questions, but, but there's Good. probably one that I want to leave. <laughs> we'll have him the back. Readers Don't with. worry. <laughs> there's probably what I want to leave our, I keep saying reader. See, that's what I'm stuck in. The <laughs> listeners uh, uh, with, do we need to fear meteorites hitting us when they're falling from space? Do I need to buy a steel umbrella? How rare is that? You know, so as people are kind of winding down, should they be afraid of meteorites smacking them in the head? The answer is yes. But <laughs> not what I probably, thought. Probably no. <laughs> not, to, not today and maybe not for 100 years. So we should not live in fear of this happening. But statistically, there's absolutely zero doubt that there will be other big impacts in the future. There are about 200 known, definitely identified meteorite craters on Earth. And most of them are very old. The big ones like Popigai that I went to and, and the Alamo Breccia and the Great Bay Basin and s s the other Vrida Fort in South Africa, these other giant ancient craters, they're, they're in the millions or hundreds of millions of years old. So some of them aren't even visible from the surface anymore. And of course, the Shiksalub event that now fairly universally believed to have resulted in the extermination of the dinosaurs. So these things have happened over and over and but, over again in Earth's past, but they've been spread out. So but what I meant, has, you, 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 yeah, you said, you said, Jeff, that someone was talking about finding it in their driveway. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about sitting on my couch worried about like just a small one that just comes through the roof and like bangs me on upside the head. I mean, I don't need to worry about that, right? That's well, that, that I mean, it, <laughs> it's rare, but it but it's happened several times in our lifetime. So the, the Park Forest fall in uh, over Chicago in the early 2000s, a, a rock did go right through somebody's house and wow. and bounced around in in their living room and that that rock and the the room has been preserved by by Alan Lang, the the great collector. So it happens every few years, there's a close call. So the Peekskill car was hit in 1992 in New York. The Claxton mailbox was hit. There's the famous story of, of, the, of, the, of the meteorite that almost hit Salakoga 
uh, almost hit a woman, also came through a house in, in ni- the 1950s in Alabama. So there, there are a lot of close calls. We still don't have a definitive, provable instance of a human out walking the dog being hit by a meteorite. And there sure are people who've come forward and claimed they've been hit by meteorites, <laughs> but so far it's always been shown to be a scam. If, if so, you were hit by even a small meteorite, you probably wouldn't be standing in front of a news camera talking about it. So terminal velocity is about two to 300 miles an hour, which is about how mm-hmm. fast the golf ball is, hit, is, is traveling when it's first hit. So if you get hit in the head by a rock, even a small one at 300 miles an hour, you're probably not going to be laughing about it on camera. So... <laughs> Do most don't live in fear, Tarek? Uh, I know you're a courageous guy, uh, so I, I don't want to. I don't want to instill this creeping fear in you. Most potential meteorites. Now we know the word. Most meteoroids burn up in the atmosphere. Thanks for the atmosphere. It allows us to breathe and it protects us. Look at the surface of the moon that doesn't have an as- uh, atmosphere. It's covered in craters of all sizes. So if we didn't breathe and we didn't have an atmosphere, we'd get hit by a lot more meteorites. But fortunately, it, is, it, it gives us life in two ways, providing us oxygen and it acts as a shield for the protection of the smaller, the smaller incoming potential meteorites. But it is a, it is a threat. It, it is a factor. We, everyone remembers the Chelyabinsk fireball that w- was seen over, over Russia in, in February 2013. That was a relatively small meteoroid. In, in, in the scheme of things. And everybody in the world saw that, partially because of those dash cams that everyone has in <laughs> Russia because of all the fraud and crime on the road, which is an interesting way in which uh, bad human behavior actually contributed, actually furthered meteorite science. So that's, that's for pretty small potatoes. Even the big piece that fell in the lake, in Lake Cher- Cherbarkel, that they, the divers went down and pulled out that was in the hundreds of pounds. That's very small in in comparison to meteorites that have hit the earth in in history. So as you well know, being space experts, there are asteroid defense programs. I'm a very long time supporter of the B612 Foundation and Asteroid Day. Mm -hmm. They're wonderful people, uh, very, take this threat very seriously. And while we believe that we have identified all or nearly all of the larger asteroids that exist in our solar system, even a medium sized impact in a city could cause devastation. And and look at let's look back at the Chelyabinsk impact. Now, it's quite well known, the media reported this, that around 1,200 people were injured by this meteorite fall, but they didn't get hit by a meteorite. It yeah. was a shock wave of it exploding many miles up in the atmosphere, far away from Chelyabinsk. That shock wave shattered hundreds or thousands of windows in the city. And people were, this is a good tip, if you ever see a real big fireball and hear sounds and explosions, don't watch it from the window because those windows exploded <laughs> and there's some right. really scary video. I mean, it looks like a special effect from a Mission Impossible film, those windows exploding. So people were injured by, by shattered glass from the shockwave of the meteorite that did not land in the city. That was, it, was consider, it was a considerable distance. So imagine something, say, 10 times bigger than that, that happens right over New York or, or Los Angeles or London. You're talking serious, very large number of injuries and damage. And if a big meteorite, like meteor crater size, or we wouldn't want this to happen, Papagai Siberia size, it's, a, it's potentially the end of civilization or at least enormous losses and disruption in life. So yeah, it's a serious threat. It might not happen for another million or 10 million years, but chances are within statistically in the next 10 to 50,000 years, we're, we're overdue for a medium size impact. So you might want to get a crash helmet. That tinfoil yeah. hat's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a, a huge pleasure and we're going to have to have you back because much to Burke's dismay, we didn't get to your punk rock career. Uh, we didn't get to your comic book career. We didn't get to your pub- much of your pub- publishing activities or anything else but um what's the easiest way to find out what's coming up next for you well i'm very active on social media i'm i'm jeff notkin g-e-o-f-f-n-o-t-k-i-n on twitter instagram facebook youtube i have an active youtube channel i'm uh, i'm very friendly 
And most most of the social media work that I've been doing recently has been has been connected to this en- enormous auction that we're doing later this month. And and as I've I've had such a wonderful life in meteorites and been fortunate enough to go on so many marvelous adventures and put together this collection, I have now reached the point in my life where I want that collection that has meant everything to me to go back out into the world and be enjoyed by other people. It's done its time in in my cabinets and my exhibit spaces. And and as I as I uh, try to live a, a simpler life, I'm very ecologically minded. I, I would like to leave a smaller footprint on this planet, although continue my my meteorite hunting adventures. I My wish is that this collection uh, that has been described by many as a world-class collection or, or one of the one of the better private collections in the world would would go out to new homes and be enjoyed by people as I have enjoyed it and and some of the proceeds are going to to charities and nonprofits that I care about it, notably Beads of Courage which is a, a wonderful children's charity and Texas Through Time which is a science and paleontology foundation in Hillsborough Texas and I, I selected them because I see the work, I see the good work that they do in the world hands on. They touch people's lives. They make difference in people's lives. And so the science world's been very good to me. And I, I would wish to give back in, in thanks for the marvelous life of adventure I've had. Well, very good. And you can find more info on that auction at haauctions.com. No period, no gaps, no dashes, haauctions.com. Tark. Where can we track little bits and pieces of your illustrious career? <laughs> well, uh, sadly, the last twenty years. How'd you all like that? Space.com. <laughs> <laughs> they're all st- they're all still at space.com. I'm on the the, the Twitter as well at Tarek J Malik. Uh, you can find uh, uh, me this weekend, hopefully getting my green belt in Taekwondo and watching to Ooh. see if Astra. Yeah, watching to see if Astra gets a. Uh, uh, gets some uh, hurricane watching satellites up for NASA's Tropics mission. So that'll be pretty exciting to see this weekend. Well, and if you want to learn more about me, you can always see me shackled to my desk at adastromagazine.com or pilebooks.com. And I want to thank you for listening today. We're going to have Jeff Notkin back soon because he's just too fascinating for one short hour plus a few minutes. Uh, You can always send us feedback at TWIS at twit.tv. That's TWIS at twit.tv. New episodes publish every Friday on your favorite podcatcher, so make sure to subscribe. And do tell your friends because we're that exciting. And you can always head to our website at twit.tv slash TWIS. Thanks, and see you next time. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows, plus membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support. <laughs>